Hi, Shawan. Shawan, good morning. Good morning, Bo. How are you? Oh, pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. I see you're in your office. Yes. Yes. So from this week, I start to come back to office. I continue to avoid my office, still enjoy my winter break mode. So what, what about your staff members? Are they going to? They're in their office this week. Oh, they're in the office. OK. Yeah. But we continue to have Zoom meetings, even if we would be in our office. Okay. We try to avoid in-person meetings. I see. So your st our staff members seem like uh, um, always tend to. So the university has a two-day policy. To up to two days, they can work from home. So, what a, well, what's the uh, particular policy in your department? Same. So, to up to two days. Right. Oh, okay. Let's see, then maybe we are. Uh, we were a little bit stricter, and uh, we have one day, up to one day. So. Oh, your department is one day. Yeah, and so maybe we can relax to up to two days. If they can arrange their flexibility yeah especially in the omicron situation i think it's uh, mm. it's better to be more flexible yeah now this week they are all gone they're all still work from home <laughs> <laughs> so i feel i should stay uh, in office in case sure. uh, anything so you are the only commander in chief so in case someone <laughs> has something so uh i think i can be here but yeah. uh, so far, everything is smooth, so that's good. Yeah, I'm in and out uh, my office, but uh, try to avoid to stay there too long. Oh, uh, if I nobody, not many people, really nobody here. So it's pretty safe for me. Yeah, my building is a ghost building. Um, mm -hmm. My worry is if I would be in my office, uh, yeah. our department staff actually would have pressure to be there. Oh. <laughs> Oh, okay. I see. I see. It's really not much going on at all. Mm. Yeah, re really, uh, before the school starts, I guess not so many people showing up. So right now in, uh, in this building, I feel very safe. <laughs> Empty <laughs> building. We moved yeah, to uh, Japan. We moved to your previous building, CAP. Oh, you're in CAP. Yes. Oh, we uh, we don't like that beauty. <laughs> um, I think uh, what's, uh, it's it's fine. Uh, we did uh, we uh, did some basic uh, remodeling, like uh, change change some uh, like old carpet, and also built some walls to separate uh, big offices into small uh, to divide into small offices. So. So, so 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 far is our alumni hall was really old building. So we start from a very low position. So cab doesn't bother <laughs> us. Everything everything's relative. Yeah, everything's relative. Well, we got a nice crowd here. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Morning. Good morning. Yeah. Morning. And, so uh, we can start. Right? Should we start? Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can share a screen. Um, oh, was disabled. Can somebody? Yeah, you uh, should. You should, should meet your host. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I see, uh, boy, I see your slide, yeah, now. Okay, great. So thanks to everybody for joining today's uh, meeting. So I think it, it, it's going to be a very informal um, talk, mainly just try to- um, You can try to really for the budget. I'm sorry, what was the comment? Uh, sorry, that was just some background noise. Oh, okay, no problem. 
So basically, I just wanted to, uh, based on my talk, we can maybe discuss more uh, what we discuss more specifically what we wanted to do. Um, so I prepared three uh, topics to talk about. I don't know how far we can go, but it doesn't matter. Um, so we just go as uh, as uh, as uh, slow or as fast as we want. Um, so the first one I want to talk about the spatial extremes. And particularly, I would like to talk about the return value estimation for spatial extremes. And uh, the second one, uh, I wanted to talk about a comparison between two random fields. And uh, the reason I choose this topic I, is because I think it's related to reproducibility. Uh, based on one talk I heard about reproducibility uh, a while ago, seems like uh, they are trying to compare different testing results or numerical results and try to say uh, whether those two are essentially the same, given the consideration that everything has noise. So we cannot expect, uh, for, some, for certain things, we cannot expect exactly the same numbers uh, are reproduced, but uh, as long as the basic the essential structure are the same, and then we can say it's reproducible. So that was um, the reason. And third one, I was to, uh, thinking about uh, change point estimation for uh, spatial functional data. And all of those three are um, have application in climate or in geospatial data and uh, environmental, uh, environmental problems. So I think it's very uh, relevant to our uh, grant. So the first one uh, is uh, flexible and a fast spatial return level estimation. Um, this was uh, by a former student of me, Daniel Sass, who just uh, graduated last year. Um, so extreme, extreme events, I think everyone here um, have already um, Heard about uh, everyone is familiar with what what is extreme events uh, like hurricanes, uh, uh, fires, and the tornadoes and the floods, and particularly to not uh, to Midwest. I think tornadoes is our biggest threat uh, in this region. Um, so, what is the spatial extremes? So, if we observe extreme values at different geographical uh, geography uh, geographic locations in a spatial region. Let's say we have uh, 50 weather stations in, in Illinois, and uh, we observe extreme temperature, the extremely hot temperature at all those 50 weather stations. And then likely, if the weather stations are close uh, in uh, geographical distance, and then they tend to, to, to be similar. So that means there are some dependence yeah, the spatial extreme data. And then how to capture those uh, dependence is, uh, is a difference between you model extreme value in a particular one single location you know, and, and model the extreme value at a bunch <clears throat> of uh, locations um, together. So the, um, the most uh, comprehensive model is to model the join distribution of all those extremes at all 50 locations in Illinois, let's say. And the most classical model for the joint modeling of spatial extremes is a mock stable model. Uh, I'm, not I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the terminology mock stable model. So mock stable model um, is um, the very uh, traditional spatial extremes model. Uh, but the computation for that, for Max Stable model, is a real, uh, really big issue. So basically, uh, if you have more than three locations, it's um, very difficult, if it's not impossible, to write down the likelihood function of the spatial, uh, of the Max Stable model. So the computation become a very big bottleneck for uh, spatial extreme analysis. Um, so, and then uh, now I wanted to uh, talk a little bit, uh, define what is, uh, how, to, how, how do we usually um, classify what is extreme values? So there are two typical ways to classify what you, uh, to classify this, uh, the extreme values. 
One is called the block maximum, and the other one is a peaks over threshold. The block maxima is um, you divide the data set into uh, equal, equal length period, and then you choose the maxima value from each period. So let's say you, if you observe 50 year of temperature data uh, at uh, Champagne weather station, and then you divide them into 50 year. And so you find that the annual maxima temperature uh, at uh, in, within each year. And then this 50 values is, is an extreme value data set. And uh, this, the, the, this extreme value is obtained from maxima, uh, block maximum. And for although for this data set, actually, uh, you don't need to consider like whether it's uh, um, this is a normal, like a, when, we, when we try to model data, we often try to figure out whether this is normal distribution, gamma distribution, or um, uh, whether it's uh, exponential distribution or something like that. But for extremes, actually it's relatively easy. You don't have many other choices. If you, uh, if you re, uh, obtain the, uh, the extreme value from the block maximum, and uh, all of them will convert to generalized uh, extreme value distribution, the GEV distribution, uh, with three parameters. I will show you the distribution form uh, very shortly. Um, and uh, there is a criticism for obtaining extreme value through the block maximum. Because um, if you have a, a one year data and you basically only get one data points from this 365 days. So you throw lots of data um, in which is often avoided in, uh, in statistical analysis. Um, so there is another way to do that to kind of like a ease the, uh, the, uh, the, the issue of throwing too much, too much data points. Um, it's called a pick over threshold. So you first uh, choose a threshold and then any value above this threshold is called extreme values. Um, so for the, for, the, for the values that exceeding the limit, so basically the point that the, the values that above the threshold subtract subtract the threshold, um, all of them follow a generalized Pareto, uh, Pareto, generalized Pareto distribution, the GPD. And, uh, um, and actually this GEV and the GPD are essentially the same distribution, but it's just in a different form because of uh, threshold is introduced in the, in the peak over threshold. So they are pretty consistent uh, what distribution they would, uh, they would convert to. And for extreme uh, value analysis, a very important goal is to estimate the T-year return level. So you probably have heard the 50-year return levels and 100-year return levels. So I was in a ship building business before I came to statistics. So when we build ships, so let's say, we need to consider what's the 100-year uh, return level of the wave amplitude. Uh, like those type thing. I think for engineering or for like uh, many uh, water management, the return level is very important because this gives us an idea uh, what the mo what's the worst situation uh, in the next, uh, let's say, 50 years, 100 years. So when we design some structure, let's say the water dam, we need to consider what's the 100 year return level of sea, le of, uh, uh, of sea levels. So we can uh, give the, um, the necessary strength of the water dam um, and uh, many other things, I think. Uh, um, and also when we try to, to plan, uh, even plan for the, for the um, agriculture and what's the next 10 year return level of the, uh, of the temperatures of the flood of the precipitation. All of those are very important information and especially for, I think for actual era science, um, extreme values is the thing that they need to prepare for. So I have talked about the GEV distribution, GPD distribution. So what are, the, uh, what are those distributions? So this is a GEV distribution. Uh, there are three parameters. The mu parameter is called a location parameter and the sigma is a scale parameter. And uh, there is one, uh, one very important parameter is called a shape parameter. So the shape parameter determines 
the GeV distribution, um, the, for the, the shape of the GeV distribution. So if uh, this parameter, shape parameter is positive, then you would observe a heavy right tail of the GeV distribution. But if uh, this, and the, so this can be used to model the maximum values of uh, extremes, uh, the maximum extreme values. And uh, uh, if the shape parameter is a small uh, negative, per negative, and then this GeV distribution has longer, uh, has long left tail. So if you have, if you want to max, uh, model the minimal extreme, let's say the coldest temperature, and then uh, the negative shape parameter can be used to model such extreme values. Sorry. Um, and then uh, for the GPD distribution, um, so a, mu, uh, the, uh, a U is introduced as a threshold. So we only model the conditional distribution that this value first has to, to be above the threshold. And then we only observe, we only model the excesses X minus U, not directly the U. So we only model the excesses and this follows the GPD distribution. And because we already have introduced one parameter threshold, this is already like the, the location parameter. So in the GPD distribution, we only observe two parameters. One is a scale parameter, the sigma tilde, and the other one is uh, the shape parameter, the Cassi parameter. Um, so those two distributions, actually, they have a relationship they can transform to each other. So that's why I said the GEV and the GPD are essentially the same distribution. And then uh, what is the tier return level of extremes? So I only use a GEV distribution to give, uh, to illustrate what's the return level, but for GPD it's the same idea. So the tier, the tier return level uh, is nothing new. It's just like a quantize of a distribution. So let's say the G, the big G, we, we call this one is a GEV distribution. And the tier return level is just a quantile of this uh, distribution at one minus one over T. So if your GV distribution is obtained from the annual data, if it's not obtained from annual data, let's say from monthly data, you have to adjust what, it, what, what T here. So let's make it simple. Let's say we have uh, annual data. And then if you wanted to have a 50 year return level, so basically it's one minus one over 50. So it's 0.98. 0.98 percentiles or quantiles of this distribution. So this is the tier return level. So if a T is large, let's say 100 a year, um, so this would be the quantile of 0.99. So if your T is large and then your quantiles become larger and larger, so which means uh, your return level becomes larger and larger. So you would observe uh, the, the worst situation becomes worse and worse if, uh, if T is larger. Um, and uh, for the tier return, tier return level for GPD uh, is a different form because the distribution of GPD and the GEV are different, but the same idea that you just try to get the quantiles or percentiles from the GPD distribution. So please stop me whenever you have a, a question. So we just wanted to uh, to be interact more as 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 interact uh, interactive as possible to just uh, to to be um, more effective. Um, so any questions so far? So I try to uh, hide many technique, oh. uh, te technical technical um, well, uh, detail. Yes. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So. Conceptually, this is very clear as you presented. So for those two mm -hmm. distributions, uh, effectively they're the same, they could be transformed to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the um, what are the contexts for utilizing those two distributions? Uh, yeah. meaning, meaning, you know, when we have a particular data set, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what are the guidance and principles for employing those distributions to model the data? Yeah, very good uh, question. 
Um, I think if you have a multiple year, uh, if you have a many years, let's say 50 years, and then uh, I think annual uh, block maxima would be sufficient. Uh, so if you have 50 data points, um, and then that's, I think, to, to, uh, to, to uh, fit extreme value distribution, that should be okay. And the block maxima is, easy, uh, is an easy choice. But if you have, don't have a 50 year, if you have, let's say, 10 year data, and then uh, annual, annual maxima will, not, will give you two, two small data sets to fit a distribution. And then in that situation, I think a peak hour threshold would be more uh, um, like robust to fit, uh, to fit um, extre extreme value distribution. So I think either way should be fine, but depending on um, the situation, I think uh, the uh, amount of data available. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question, Bo? Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it seems that you're looking at extreme value over uh, uh, as a function of time. Uh, does this apply even uh, extreme value spatially? Oh, so yes. So most of the most of the study, I think that they are looking at extreme value over time. But you could consider extreme value over uh, uh, over a region. Uh, I just rarely see such such a study. But you know, in, in, in principle, technically, you can also study the extremes over a certain region. Yeah. Yeah. All those are really good questions. Um, thank you. Yeah, so I think it's interesting. I'm just wondering, okay, mm -hmm. like uh, the tornado, people actually said this year, I mean, uh, two months ago, the tornado, uh, it, it just because the Midwest or that region got it, it got it extremely warm compared to the other years. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering uh, exactly, Gary, just to give a question about it relatively on the region. I mean, so whether the difference, the weather temperature differences across a region will make a big impact on the forming of the tornado. Mm -hmm. That means, of course, if it's warm, the chance will be higher. That's why in the winter, tornadoes actually it's rare. Mm -hmm. However, if the region differences, for example, uh, this region A and some na neighbor region B, if their temperature differences is quite a lot, mm -hmm. that likely probably will be easier to form tornadoes. Uh, so I'm just wondering. Oh. You know, whether... Yeah, that's a very good conjecture. So seems like sounds like a reasonable to me because uh, different if there is a big difference and there are lots of uh, convection maybe it will cause torn tornado of course I'm not an atmospheric scientist so to me intuitively seems like that could be a plausible conjecture so uh, so we can try to verify uh, whether uh, this is the case yeah. Yeah, because if you think about a tornado, likely because it's, it, it forms the, 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 the turning the torque, right? Mm -hmm. So if, uh, there, if we study the extreme value, instead of just look at uh, the same region, same spot across years, but whether you change the observation point, you just look at the... Uh, surrounding regions, whether the, the temperature differences. Mm -hmm. To look at from that point of view, you work out some extreme value. Whether you start from that point of view to, to examine the whole thing, whether you were have any prediction on which portions the tornado risk will be higher compared uh -huh. to the others, right? Yeah, so you're talking about like a, maybe uh, study the extreme values of the differences rather than the extremes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Here, it, it seems to me they just take one value instead of thinking about the different values, mm -hmm. especially different regions. Because mm -hmm. if the region, for example, you have different weather, you know, spots. Mm -hmm. You look at different those neighboring spots. The uh, spots, their differences. You re-examine, that means your parameter, somehow your conditional 
probability originally you say greater than u, but mm -hmm. now you probably say there is a there is a gradient. Okay, you study the gradient differences to mm -hmm. see whether this uh, gradient dis differences on the extreme value mm -hmm. will impact the forma formation of the tornado. Mm -hmm. That it seems to me the weather people must have something they already know because it seems to me they are doing reasonable prediction. Even if you look at the Kentucky, this mm -hmm. time they destroyed the whole, whole town. Mm -hmm. They actually said the weather forecast was not bad. They, they sounded a few alarms before they destroyed the whole, whole, mm -hmm. whole region. Mm -hmm. I mean, they must have some computation behind uh -huh. I do not know. I just think there must be some way they can compute it beforehand. Yeah, I, I think that's a really uh, a really great um, idea to try to figure out what could be the like what what what's, uh, what extremes are particularly related to the formation of tornadoes. There must be some mechanism behind that, and we uh, maybe starting from extremes, we can try to build the relationship or association between those two. Yeah, they. I was told that actually those uh, temperatures, uh, different uh, weather stations mm -hmm. are public data. That means you actually go to the web, you look at different region every hour, they actually have, a, have some data points. Mm -hmm. So if somebody can do some computation, say why this particular tornadoes mm -hmm. uh, formed, if you just look at the gradient of the surrounding stations, mm -hmm. probably there could be some way. Yeah. I think the weatherman must, I mean, the weather station must have some kind of way to compute it. Otherwise, how could they uh, predict it or even mm -hmm. sound alarm, right? Yeah, that should be a really interesting question, particularly benefit us. We should uh, talk to some atmospheric science people and uh, say if this conjecture, uh, uh, how 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 should we study this conjecture and try to uh, try to build a safer environment from Midwest? Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have very little knowledge. This is just my con conjecture. Okay. Yeah, it's a thing out of box. I think very important. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Boli uh, I, I, and Jeremy. The slide that Boli currently has effectively answers uh, your question from a methodological perspective, because what she has is that the spatial variation in the uh, location and scale parameters of the GEV distribution can depend on covariates. And so those covariates could be the temperatures at those locations. And you could directly then test that hypothesis. In the chat, I put some uh, papers Mm -hmm. on floods that we had done you know, several years ago using exactly this kind of a framework for mm -hmm. floods mm -hmm. as a spatial process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on tornadoes, I put also some things because there has been work exactly in that direction in tornadoes as well, but mm -hmm. not from a spatial extremes uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I see. It's already that, that. Yeah, that's a clever idea to put the parameters uh, as a function of uh, of uh, temperatures, and then you can test the hypothesis. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Yeah. We'll read them, um, and then, then later Manu will give a talk, and maybe <laughs> you can tell us more about this idea, and so, and also the results, what you what you figured out. Okay. That would be great. Um, any other uh, comments? Okay, um, if no other comments, I will uh, uh, continue. So, um, so I just, uh, I, 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 I mentioned that for spatial extremes, uh, the, max, the classical max stable model uh, is too computationally difficult. So there are some other simplified ways to, to, to model the, uh, the, the spatial extremes and to estimate to return levels. So there is a one very simple, a very simple one called the spatial GEV and spatial GPD. Um, so they are very simple, and uh, they are. But uh, the because they are simple and the computation is very fast, so they can um, they can they can deal with a large like a extreme so a spatial extreme in a large uh, large domain or a large number of 
locations. And the idea for spatial extreme and spatial uh, GPD is they put the the, the uh, parameters, the mu, uh, remember that mu is a location parameter, sigma is uh, the scale parameter, and the cosy is a shape parameter. For all those parameters, um, so if they are spatial extreme, we put them as a function of uh, location S. So S is spatial location. So we think uh, those parameters depend on the location. So at different location, they can be different. And then the idea for spatial GEV is you put those uh, parameters as uh, a linear function of some covariate. And as Mano just mentioned, this covariate can be temperatures or it can be some, it can be wind or it can, be, uh, it can be any other uh, variables you think would be useful to uh, model the extremes. And similarly, for sigma s, we also uh, try, try to model it as a linear function of some covariate. And uh, we put a log is because sigma is positive. Sigma says as a scale parameter, it has to be positive. So we put log to uh, remove, to, to eliminate that restriction. And then for the shape parameter, shape parameter is a special uh, parameter, uh, but it's very important for return level estimation because the return level calculations is very sensitive to the to the CASI parameter. So if you uh, if you give an inaccurate uh, uh, estimate, that could change the return level uh, estimation quite a lot. And also, um, but uh, but but this parameter is difficult to estimate. So because of those two reasons, one is that it's difficult to estimate, and the second is uh, uh, very sensitive. Uh, the the it's uh, it, it's a crucial parameter for return level estimation. So often the spatial GEV they tend to put this as constant. <coughs> So that means they assume that um, all the um, all the spatial locations share one single shape parameter, and then uh, they can use all data to estimate this one single parameter. <coughs> Um, so this is the idea of the spatial GEV and the spatial GPD. And uh, when, when they try to estimate the parameters, so they uh, write down the likelihood function. And when they write the likelihood function, they make, uh, they make a, a, an assumption called marginal independence, which means given those mu s, sigma s, cos s, those three parameters, the, the form of those three parameters, they assume that um, the extreme values at different locations are independent given those uh, given those um, uh, the, the the form of those three parameters. So basically, all the dependence uh, in all the dependence of extreme values at the different locations are uh, reflected by the form of this x um, like uh, beta x s uh, uh, the, the, those linear functions. And uh, no other, you know, no, given this, no other dependence um, is considered in the model. Um, so surprisingly, even such a simple model um, by an early study uh, of, uh, of us with uh, uh, Yi Cao is was a master student in our department. And uh, from based on our early study, we found that even this is a simple model, it provides very good results in terms of return level estimation, even compared to the most complicated max stable process that models the Doi distribution of all those uh, spatial extremes. And, but uh, this uh, um, spatial uh, GEV and the GPD has uh, very obvious limitations, um, although they have advantage of computational efficiency. So the limitations is if the spatial domain is, is large, let's say you study the whole United States, and then for this vast region, if you still assume a constant shape parameter, then this seems unrealistic. So we cannot, it's too restrictive to, to assume that. And also for the location and the scale parameters. So if we still just assume that they follow a linear function, the beta x um, with the whatever x variable is, that could be also uh, quite restrictive to assume some linear relationship for those parameters. Uh, with the, the available covariates. So we wanted to uh, find a new uh, method that can adopt 
the computation efficiency advantage from spatial GV GPD, but uh, we also want to better account for spatial heterogeneity uh, of the shape parameter and also uh, to give uh, more flexible forms of uh, spatial variability in the location and the scale parameters. So those are the uh, goals that we wanted to uh, achieve. And uh, um, the reason we wanted to do this is because we wanted to improve the return level estimation because return level estimation is just a quantile of the distribution. So uh, as long as we can estimate the distribution well, and then we believe the return level estimation will be improved. And so we propose to uh, use a uh, fused lasso or fused reach penalty to regulate all three parameters to achieve those two goals, but still maintain the uh, computation efficiency. So uh, this is, seems complicated, but I can explain it so you can see it's really uh, not that complicated. So remember that we have the three parameters, mu, sigma, and the C for the GEV. So still this one use a GEV as example, because uh, um, uh, GPD is follow the same idea, just different distribution form. So, um, and uh, so this L is a likelihood function. So if I write down the likelihood function of the mu, sigma, C, uh, those three parameters given the data, and uh, then uh, I still assume the marginal independence. So all the, all, all the extreme values at different locations are independent. So you can simply, you can uh, easily write down what's the joint likelihood of all the data. And then uh, usually uh, for the spatial GEV GP, spatial GEV GPD, this is the, this is the end. So you just estimate the parameters based on this likelihood function. But for us, we now do not assume any particular form of mu, sigma, and the C. Uh, instead, we uh, allow them to just vary as much as they want, uh, not as much as they want. We actually put some penalty. Uh, they can vary uh, for, freely to some degree, but we add some penalty uh, for each of those three parameters. Um, so those penalty is to, let's say, uh, I just use this as example, those new other location parameters and SP and SQ, uh, we put them as SPSQ in the edge set. So any, any uh, edge set, uh, the edge means SP and SQ has to be neighbor. So we assume that if they are neighbors, uh, they should be similar. Those parameters should be similar. So the penalty is uh, put on the difference between the parameters uh, between the neighbors. So you can see that if they are neighbors and uh, the difference needs to be small because uh, this is the penalty term, we penalize the big difference between the neighbors. And the W here is a weight, uh, weight parameter. So you can further try to uh, to, to say, um, based on the distance between SP and SQ, if they are uh, the distance is larger, I wanted to give more penalty. If they are smaller, uh, I wanted to, oh, no, no, some, I'm sorry. If they are smaller, if the distance is smaller, I wanted to give more penalty to make them more similar. If they are larger, and then I give less penalty uh, to allow them to be a little bit uh, more different. So this is the W to just give you more flexibility. And then this K, you can, K can take different forms. So if K is equal one, then this is a lasso penalty. I'm sure like uh, uh, many people are familiar with this lasso penalty, rich penalty, because it has been used in many areas. So here, if K is equal one lasso penalty, um, which indicates that the mu pr the parameters are spatial clusters. So within each cluster, um, the mu parameters are the same. So you just give a different patches of the parameters. But if a k equal two, and then this goes to the very uh, traditional rich penalty. So for this, the implication of uh, k equal two is you do not observe spatial clusters that within each cluster you have the same parameter. Yes, that. Uh, no, no one is the same, exactly the same, but they just a very small the process. So for, for, uh, for nearby neighbors, they should be very similar, but uh, they may not be exactly the same. So this is a difference. 
Um, so this is the idea, the essential idea uh, for the uh, for our uh, proposed fused spatial GEV and the GPD models. And uh, in terms of how to find the neighbors, uh, we adopt a minimal spanning tree idea. Um, so the minimal spanning tree is a graph that connects all the sides together. Um, but the uh, the good thing is that this if you use a minimal spanning tree to get this graph, there is no cycles and uh, uh, the, the edges give you the uh, minimal possible total edge length. So this just uh, uh, save us uh, some uh, effort to, uh, to remove the redundant pairs of the differences and to further improve the computation. Um, so for the weight parameter, we just uh, use the inverse distance penalty, but you could use other penalty uh, related to distances or some other variables you think is important. So I explained what is a fused lasso and a fused rage penalty, depending on the uh, chi parameters. Um, so um, I think uh, what another uh, challenge of this is to the optimization. So how to optimize this, um, penalize the likelihood function. So this part, I will just like skip that. Um, if you are interested, you can uh, read our paper. Um, publishing a journal of computational graphical statistics. So uh, next I'm going to talk about how we use that to uh, on how we use uh, how we use our method on two data set. One is the precipitation data set and the other one is um, temperature data. And so any uh, more questions before I uh, talk about the applications? Uh, Bo, a real quick question. You asked about the it, computational intensity. How long does it take to run this model on a fair size data set? Just out of curiosity. Oh, yeah, good, good question. Um, so for, let's see, for this, uh, to, we, uh, this data set has 2,600 uh, locations. And I think for this one, maybe an hour, and uh, the other data set has over 8,000 over 8,000 locations. So that one uh, on a several hour on a several hour uh, magnitude, um, maybe eight hours or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but we did a report. I think we reported um, the time we used um, for computation and in the simulation, we particularly compared. Uh, the computation time of our method and the traditional methods. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for the question. Um, any other question, comments? Yeah, I, I like this, Bo. What I'm curious about is one reason we have been using Bayesian methods is because then we can get a posterior uncertainty distribution mm -hmm. of the quantiles. Mm -hmm. uh, is is there a, an analog here to do that? Because the Bayesian method is computationally very, very expensive. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, another very good question. Yes, we did uh, talk about uh, the uh, uh, estimating uncertainty. Uncertainty. I, I skipped that here in my talk. So we used the block, uh, block, block bootstrap okay. to estimate. Um, and uh, yes, so for compared to the Bayesian, uh, our method is a 400 or even uh, 400 times faster for 100 locations, I remember, and 800 times faster than uh, two, uh, if it's 200 locations. So it's the uh, Bayesian method is good. I think the Bayesian, uh, Bayesian uh, estimation for return level is very accurate. It is very good, but it's just like very computationally expensive. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so so good, good questions. So thank you. Um, any other uh, comments? Okay, then I'm going to uh, just uh, quickly show uh, the result we get for um, precipitation data. And uh, this we got this data set um, is an annual maxima daily precipitation and the two time periods. One is historical and the other one is future conditions from uh, climate models. Um, and uh, for this one, um, because, the, because it's, a, it's, a, it's a long period, it's a, um, this is a 30 periods, you know, 30 to 30 years in the past and 30 years in the future. So we think 
uh, we should build a, a trend into the location parameter. So instead of just use the mu, uh, we use the alpha plus beta. And alpha beta also depends on the location. And we again uh, try to uh, uh, build the penalty, the fuse penalty to alpha and beta uh, instead of to mu. Um, and um, so, 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 and the, so this is a basic, uh, uh, this is a particular thing for the mu parameter for uh, this data set. And others are just like the, what I talked. And so this is the parameter estimates and uh, the return level estimates. So alpha, beta, sigma, cosi, those are the four sets of parameters in our model. And uh, this is a 20 year return level estimation. Um, and this is a 100 year because, uh, the, uh, the, uh, because the mu parameters depend on the time because the mu equal alpha plus beta t. So uh, the return level estimation will also depend on t. So here we just show at t equal one, which means the beginning year. At the beginning year, what's the return level estimation arm? And uh, we also showed that uh, at one particular location. So here, this is, uh, I believe, I believe this is the, um, this is Casas, right? Sorry, I'm not very good at the geography. This is again, this state is Kansas. Is that right? Shawen? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That was Kansas. Yeah. Missouri. Oh. Missouri is the neighboring to Kansas. Oh, okay. Good. I'm, uh, I'm up, glad. After right. that, it was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Colorado and, uh, yeah, the, okay. Kansas. Okay, great. Thank you. So we picked a one, just a one location in Kansas State uh, as an example to show the trend of return level estimation. So surprisingly, we see actually a slight, a very slight, a very slight decreasing trend of the return level estimation at this location. Um, so you can see the return level is a uh, it's not uh, it's not a very big decrease. It's very slight from 2008 to 2006, from 19, 1970 to 2000. So, um, and then for the 100 year return level at this particular location, we observe the similar thing. The 100 year return level actually decreases a little bit, but this is uh, uh, just for this one particular location. And we found that for other locations, they can uh, be increasing, um, but uh, it just means that not all locations are yeah uh, has inc has increasing return level estimation. Even the uh, average temperature are increasing, but seems like uh, for the extremes, uh, for the return level of extremes, this is not the case. So this is uh, uh, and the, I, I we were surprised, but we found that other literatures actually uh, also reported similar similar observations. And then uh, we uh, also uh, applied our method to study the maximum temperature uh, change between the uh, you know 100 year period, but we divided the 100 year period uh, from 1898 to, to 1998 to 1997. So this is 100 years. So we divided them into um, half and half, the first of the uh, first 50 years and next 50 years. And we estimate the return level um, for each of the two time period. And then we also try to study, uh, study the temperature, um, the return level estimates. <laughs> Sorry, I think when I explained that, I was uh, thinking about the temperature, it's the precipitation. So the precipitation extremes uh, return level also do not, uh, also seem like a decreases in some region, but increases in another region. And then for, um, for this one, because it's a 50 year trend, uh, so we also try to build a linear trend in the location parameters. And uh, so this is a, a estimates. Um, this is a 20 year return level estimate, 100 year return level. And uh, the, um, the, the below the, the, the bottom panel shows the 20 year return level uh, difference between the 50 year uh, the, the first period and the second period. So this 20 year return level, <coughs> this is for, um, 
Uh, this is for the first 50 year return level for that period. And then the second panel is what's the difference of the return level between the first year and the second, the first 50 years and the second 50 years. Um, so you can see that for the temperature, similar situation, uh, some has a positive trend, some has negative trend. And we still you use this location, the same location in Kansas. Um, so we can see that for this particular location, the temperature return level actually decreases a little bit. Um, but for uh, other locations, you can see uh, that those are the um, the red ones, those are has positive trend that the return levels uh, increase increases over time. So those are the uh, so this is uh, um, the um, main um, kind of like the main the, the, the main things in the, uh, we developed in our uh, in our uh, project. So we developed a computationally efficient but a, a very flexible fused the spatial GEV and the spatial GPD models. And those are uh, through the penalized regression. Um, so because the, the penalized regression, because of this penalized regression, and we did also did some, uh, some uh, uh, we also made some efforts to kind of like uh, uh, use uh, uh, tail expansion to try to uh, decompose the complicated likelihood function into some quadratic form. So we can use a very, um, very uh, computationally efficient to those uh, GRM G, uh, uh, packages that develop, develop, developed by the, the Stanford group. So that's why we can get computation, get computational efficiency. So this uh, can be uh, applied to a large data set like over 800 locations, which may not be, which may not be same, uh, may not seem like a very large. Uh, for spatial data, it's strange. So when we talk about a large data set in spatial, for other people, uh, this is nothing. 800, 800, uh, uh, 8,000 observations, that's nothing. But because of the dependency structure, um, so more than 200, usually more than 2,000 locations, the traditional spatial spatial, spatial methods cannot work very well, even like uh, not dealing with, even for the Gaussian, Gaussian process, not the extreme values. Uh, over 2,000, your covariance matrix uh, will give you a hard time if you just use the traditional uh, classical methods. And uh, we, uh, our method used a non-parametric representation of all the parameters. And uh, our simulation studies show that we can improve the return level estimation compared to the uh, spatial GEV and spatial GPD. Uh, but I wanted to make a, a point comment that um, the basic methods still seems to give better return level estimation, but uh, um, the computation is super, uh, intolerable almost like, especially the number of location, when the number of locations is large. Um, and another nice thing about our method is we do not need to make uh, like stationarity, like a basic methods, you need to give the model and often you need to assume that is a, is a stationary uh, random process, which means the dependence depends only on the distance between two locations, but uh, not the, um, not where they are and not the direction, but we do not need to have that, those uh, stationary assumption. So this is the summer, summarize of uh, our paper. So uh, it seems like uh, it's about an hour, so I don't think I can get to the next uh, two topics, but in the future, uh, when we are interested in reproducibility, maybe I can go back to those two projects we did and uh, see if we can get to build some connection between these and uh, the reproducibility. So I think I, I will stop here. Thank you very much again for your time and uh, uh, attention and the discussions. I really like those discussions. Thank you. Thanks very much for, um, this is really helpful. And I especially saw some related papers shared by Manu. I captured those in our meeting notes. Mm -hmm. uh, this was done actually quite uh, a few years ago. You know, one of the papers I saw 
uh, Manu's work uh, used this 2016, yeah, using GEV. Um, so I encourage the group to actually uh, check out those papers Manu shared, and also Jiawei had some really interesting thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. And I anticipate from our science team, we would uh, actually run into uh, various situations of spatial extremes, you know, making this methodology actually quite attractive, uh, especially due to the challenges of computation. So, um, uh, yes, we're running out of time. <laughs> oh, I'm running out of time. No, no, no. We are oh, about. Oh, yeah, we're about, yeah, about, yeah, about it too. But, uh, but we definitely uh, will take the ring check. Uh, I think the topics you mentioned. Uh, as, as part of your presentation you have prepared, definitely gonna be of interest. So, uh, so we'll take your offer and uh, schedule your, uh, your presentation for the other topics later. Uh, yeah, maybe we could open the floor uh, a little bit more, see uh, any other questions folks might have. Yeah, thank you for your nice comments, Gary, uh, Manu and everyone, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I see Gary needs to uh, needs to leave now. Uh, awesome presentation, but well, interesting. I I I I I see these more as an input into oh. species distribution modeling because a lot of what has been done on that regard has used these trends on average precipitation and temperature, but the inclusion of extremes has been lacking. So this is something that we need to start doing more often and outputs like yours seem very interesting and useful for that. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think now extremes have become uh, <clears throat> more, get more and more attention because of the uh, climate change causing so much disasters. So uh, before maybe people uh, study more about uh, different the associations connection with the average climate variables. And then now I think people pay more attention to the extreme climate var uh, extremes in the climate variables. So this is something that definitely have a lot of potential, uh, I feel. Yeah, it's very nice talk. So I'm just wondering when people model the extreme, like you said, you get a threshold Mm -hmm. But there are many ways to model extremes. For example, you can say uh, anything is top, uh, you know, like a surrounding ones is, I like, guess, the top 5% or something like this. But I'm just wondering whether there are any systematic study in the community define different ways to define the stream and the conditional probability or these and study which kind of variables will be more telling. Oh, yeah. So for, <clears throat> right. So for the, how to define the extremes. So let's say you said five percentile. So the, those are actually the uh, very uh, popular strategy to choose a percent, to choose a threshold. I just, so given the data, I just choose a five percentile. Uh, five, uh, I just choose the top 5%. Yeah, as my extremes. And I think, uh, um, so it's a balance, like uh, how much data you wanted to have for your extremes and how extremes it is to make it asymptotically convert to an extreme value distribution. So if you choose a too low percentile and then it doesn't convert to, to uh, you, you, you get a lot of data. Let's say I could choose the uh, top 50%, you get a half of your data, but uh, this data doesn't follow, uh, very likely doesn't follow, uh, doesn't follow the uh, GPD distribution. So GPD distribution has to, um, the, the, the distribution is defined that as your threshold goes to infinity, it converts to a GPD distribution. And for the uh, GEV distribution, also defines as your block length goes to infinity. It's extreme, enough extreme to, 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 to make sure that those data really follow the extreme value distribution, but also you do not want to lose 
so to to throw away so much data because you only wanted to have a very few uh, extreme values. So there are systematic methods uh, to try to find what the threshold you should use. There are uh, many many different ways to to determine what's the threshold you should use. Basically, I think a very simple idea is uh, after you take the threshold, whether you can say, uh, if you try different threshold and then at a, at a certain value, um, the distribution, uh, the sheet parameter may not change that much. And then this could, this would be, this can be a very plausible threshold, some, some idea like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. I, I had no study on this, uh, but just a wonder because, for example, with climate change, the threshold likely will need to be changed, right? If you use the same threshold you studied 20 years ago, you know, the data probably cannot find anyone match this threshold. So there, there must be lots of parameters to be tuned. Mm -hmm. but I think it's good. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh -huh. so if I have to have to finish, yeah. Thanks a lot for the, for the for the presentation. Uh, I think uh, lots of people are there, very interested in it. Great, thank you. Thank you. So thank next you. week, uh, who will be the presenter? Uh, is Diana still on the call? No, I think Diana went for the other meeting. She just had to. Uh, uh when we put together the schedule uh, when last week uh, was Diana was, was she there to be aware of uh, next week is her turn to present the, uh, the paper she shared also the body of knowledge uh, taxonomy? Uh, I suspect not. Hmm. Maybe Shawa, you can send her email. Right, yeah, on and we'll follow up with her. I'll follow up with her. Uh, but she's also planning to do one for, um, I guess, the education group. So we just discussed it yesterday. Um, so maybe it's better to combine. But that was in February, I guess. Eric, uh, am I remembering correctly? Um, yeah, so on the list of iGUIDE presentations, I'll toss it in the chat. Um, yeah, this is a new one which we have been just creating. Yeah, um, Diana was planning on February 1st-ish um, for talking about body of knowledge. One of the reasons why we pushed it out is because we thought that this group would be interested in what she has to say um, as well. So we could talk to Diana and figure out which meeting it makes sense for her to present in and then try to kind of get all the groups that should be listening um, in to listen to her. Yeah, I think this group might be uh, more research centered. Uh, you know, the education workforce development team is uh, perhaps more on, in, you know, focusing to uh, the activities in that regard. So I would suggest a research oriented presentation, just like what we heard today from Bo and what we heard before from Jia Wei. Uh, so this needs to go to some nuts and bolts of research. Uh, yeah, I'll reach out to Diana and see uh, if she's able to do it for next I have a hard time to imagine uh, education workforce development team needs a research heavy presentation from Diana on, uh, on the taxonomy and uh, the paper she shared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Sean, I, Sean, I need to go and start the other meeting. They're waiting for me. Okay. Thanks very much again. We'll figure out who will present or likely be Diana. Yeah. All right. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.